long, long day. I got a lot to say. It feels like I'm carrying a two-ton weight. I go to see a friend. Hello, I'm Monsignor Patrick Winslow. And I am Father Matthew Kauth. And we are speaking from the rooftop. A podcast brought to you by Tan Books, in which we invite you to join our conversation out here in the open air. Where we look out upon the world around us from the rooftop of the church and share with you what we see. It makes me Hello there. Greetings and welcome back to From the Rooftop. I got to say, the other day, I received a glorious little gift. Remember, I think we had one time in which someone gave us some mittens, hand on mittens and oh, some yeah. other things, remember? Oh, yeah, because we're on the roof. Because we're on the roof. And someone dropped off um, a bottle of bourbon in case we got chilly up here, <laughs> which I just thought was a great idea. I think it's a brilliant idea. So, are you fishing? Shout out to that. No, you fi- no, 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 no. <laughs> One must stay sober. But uh, you know, it's funny. You know, in the Northeast, um, as a priest up there in upstate New York, I would run into you know parishioners at the liquor store because you have to buy your wine at the liquor store. You have to buy everything at the liquor store. You can't buy wine in the grocery store. Mm. So you buy everything at the liquor store. So you run into all sorts of people, and they're buying. You know, scotch and whiskey and bourbon and, and the stuff for the holidays, as well as their wines. And it was common to see a priest walk in and see all these people. I moved down here. Oh, yeah. And people looked at me like I was in an adult bookstore. I was walking in to a, li- you know, to a, like a liquor store. Yeah. And I'm like, what is, why am I getting glared at? Mm-hmm. And you would have thought I was in a place of ill repute. Yeah. And it was such a cultural difference between the North and the South. That's true. Absolutely. I mean, there's so many counties here that are dry. The restaurants, right? <laughs> I, I didn't under- So it's a complete difference mm-hmm. uh, between the uh, the Northeast experience. Uh, maybe and you feel guilty, right? Because you think, okay, I am fulfilling, I don't want to, I don't I scandalize fulfilling people. fulfilling the narrative of whatever this particular uh, um, denomination is about hey, priests. <laughs> so one time. But if they're in there, mm-hmm. that's what I always said to myself. Yes. Wait a minute. If you're a if you're a particular denomination that has a problem with this, you shouldn't be in here either. Well, that's a good point. <laughs> so, um, you know, it always elicited a comment or two from the yes. person behind the counter. Yes. Uh, you know, when you're in the collar, and I said, "Well, I come to where you work. You should come to where I work." Yeah, exactly. It's a good. It's a good. <laughs> to, the, to the invite, but you know, it's true. The, the cultural perceptions of these sorts of things, but. What made me think about it is, you know, somebody giving the, the gift of like a bourbon or whatever. That was a very common gift in the Northeast yeah. is to get a, a bottle. I think scotch was very common. Scotch was more common than I think the, the cler- clerical culture of scotch up there is up there, there. B- b- We're b- closer b- to Kentucky here. So I think it's probably Well, that's bourbon. true. It was a bourbon. But that was a very common. Do you uh, remember, though, this is probably one of my funniest moments ever in an ABC store. Um, so to fill you all in, Father Winslow had just been assigned to a new parish. And what we try to do when a priest friend of ours gets assigned a new assignment is to not have them enter that assignment alone, because that's always a bit unnerving and unsettling. And so a bunch of us got together, and we helped him move, and we moved him into his his new rectory. And we had been, we've done this several times, because we've all been moved several times. Um, and so we get everything set up, and we're going to make some dinner together, et cetera, and spend the night and say some prayers and what have you. So invariably, you're looking to set up your bar. Right, you want to make sure that you have the drinks for the guys that come, whatever else, and and so we went off to the ABC store, um, which is what the liquor store is down here in North Carolina, and we just got all the the staples basically. So whoever came, they would have what they wanted. So all the basic staples. I seem to recall we had to walk out with, with to a make box. a box, and so we had to walk out with a box, like a big and it was box. clear that we were making an impression, <laughs> right? Because here you are with with you know four or five six guys in a collar. And a significantly sized box to set up a bar. And instead of feeling embarrassed, because Father Winslow never feels embarrassed, um, instead of feeling embarrassed, he picks <laughs> up the box. <laughs> he picks up the box and walks out. He, su- he says to the guy behind the counter, see you next week. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I do remember that now. It was the that best was my line. introduction to the ABC story. Yeah, I'm the new pastor. I'll be here. See you next see week. See you next week as we walk out with a cart. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Well, you know, <clears throat> you know, one of the things 
I noticed or I, I've been attentive to recently in the prayers at Mass. Sometimes that's referred to in theological circles as eucology, mm. the, that's a, the, the study of, of prayers. But I've noticed in the prayers at Mass a reference to our Lord as His Majesty, that royal reference. And it makes sense this time of year, mm-hmm. especially since um, we've celebrated the Feast of Christ the King to end the previous liturgical year. So that sense of moving toward the kingdom of God where our Lord is prince and king of that of that new realm. So what struck me more recently is I I found myself intrigued with some of these Asian dynasties. Um, and in particular with their a, a desire to see something divine in a princely figure. And then I contrast that with what I know about some of the Western sovereigns and our understanding of divine right, divine right monarchies coming out of the um, the Middle Ages and, and that way. There was also not something divine, but at least the divine right monarchy was the notion that at least the hand of God wanted that person governing, right. you know, that monarch governing. There was some connection there. <clears throat> Obviously, uh, prescinding from political theory and uh, the blending of theology and governance, kind of separating those things out, um, are just kind of separate, not really entering into those things. The tendency or the, the, the human tendency or the notion to ascribe something close to the divine with royalty, I, and now seeing these prayers and recognizing these prayers, I find it all very fascinating because I don't think that we think, generally speaking, of God and our Lord so often in majestic terms. I think the tendency of the modern era is to think of God in more um, spiritual language, uh, more um, communal language, but not as your majesty. Yeah. Uh, recognizing the dignity, the nobility of the one with whom we're engaging. I don't know. I, I, I'm just, I'm struck by it because it seems to me that there's something woven into our human nature that desires this or is oriented toward it. And we see it satisfied in the fulfillment of divine revelation and the person of Christ who sits at the right hand of the Father as the King of the universe. And this is not just sort of flowerly language. Yeah. This is what we talk about as a reality. Uh, for people who don't like royal, you know, the the, the, the whole royal phenomena, you're going to have to get over it relative to God because <laughs> that's the way it goes. Yeah, there is a sovereign in heaven, yeah. right? There's no democracy. There is no democracy. There is a sovereign. And uh, there's no escaping that. Uh, I think you're right. And I think that in the, the general movement toward egalitarianism in such a way that we would we all want equal opportunities right and then that sort of begins to transfer into equal outcomes which is a huge problem right because it's not a merit system it's not a hierarchical system and everything down to the smallest microbe in creation has always created hierarchies and there's a reason for that because there is a hierarchy there's a hierarchy to being and there's a hierarchy um, inside of heaven itself and you want, there's something that we long for about having that noble king, that to serve a Lord. You know, we, we call him Lord all the time, mm-hmm. but I think it's been evacuated of its context and, it, and, it, and its meaning. Like, do you ever think about him being a Lord when you say the word, oh, my Lord, or, oh, or Lord, help me with this? You don't think about him as being your Lord insofar as a king. Um. And I, that, that thought struck me tremendously when I first went into seminary um, because I was looking for an image in some ways to replace the image that I had gotten growing up. Because the image I had gotten growing up was that Jesus was basically... Um, the friend. A friend. and But a friend that never really asked you to do anything and didn't really have any problems with anything you did. And who wore really bad... The friend of, who was there for you. Yeah, if you wanted him. And you don't have to be there for him. If you wanted him, yeah. You know, he, he never let you down. Right. 
Um, but, you know, you'd come to him when you needed him. Yeah. And ultimately, he was wearing sort of a, a rather short, cropped sort of rag sack um, thing with a belt and almost sort of Franciscan-esque um, in, in terms of imagination. And I remember distinctly, um, maybe this is too revelatory, but I remember distinctly sitting out in this field one time and I was looking at the sunset over this, this mountains in Colorado. And I recalled my impression when I was a boy of Aslan you know, being this, this lion that was the king. You, there are a lot of people that haven't yeah, so the Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis, mm-hmm. he has, it was made into a movie not long ago, but it, Chronicles of Narnia were, were children's stories, but they're not just children's stories. They're certainly stories for adults too, um, in which these kids get pulled out of our world into a different world and they meet this lion and this lion um, can talk and so can the animals, etc. But w- what's interesting about the lion is that, of course, the lion is Christ in a different world. And his name is? His name is Aslan. That's who you're um, referencing. And the, the line uh, that is throughout the, the book is that Aslan is not a tame lion, but he is good. And those two things kind of go together. And so I've been thinking about this relative and never made the connection when I was a kid that this even referred to Christ. Hmm, interesting. And thinking to myself that I never liked the image of Christ that I was given. And so even when I went up to receive First Holy Communion, I pretended that it was Zeus up there, like giving me a lightning bolt. <laughs> that's well, that's interesting. Because I, I wanted something that was more powerful right, right. than me, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so the thought about that line from, about Aslan, that he's, a, he's good, but he's, he's tame, but he's good. He's not tame, but he's good. He's not tame, but he's good. So you're scared on the one hand to be in his presence, but he's good. And so you don't have to be at the same time. That difference between fear of the Lord and his majesty um, and the fact that anything he wills is going to be good. Long story short, um, I end up in this place, in this field in Colorado and all of a sudden I had the distinct impression that the Son of God was next to me. Hmm. Never happened to me before in my life hmm. when I was a kid. And I didn't turn... He was on my left side in my own mind. Mm -hmm. And I didn't turn because I had such a sense of his majesty. Interesting. And I was so afraid, A, of what I had thought about him before and the way I had treated him, but the sense of the weight of his majesty, of his glory. And certainly it wasn't an experience like John on Patmos where he sees Christ, whom he had known so well. And his his clothing is like whiter than a fuller's lie and light and and, and lightning coming out of him, as it were. And and he's afraid. His friend throws his face down on the ground until Christ touches him and says, don't be afraid, it is I. Um, And then interpreting that scene that happened to me, it completely transformed my thoughts about Christ. And all of a sudden it matched up with what I loved about Aslan. Mm. Never having known that Aslan was a figure of Christ. Yeah. So I, I, I resonate with that completely about his majesty because I always do think about his majesty from that moment on. You no, know, I, I can, I can see why. I, 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 well, first of all, I say as a methodolog- methodological note, this is a perfect example of how you and I we have conversations and we just circle something mm-hmm. uh, because I feel like I meandered and wandered in a circle when I queued up that topic. <laughs> You always would cue him up, though. Yeah, well, but it's the reason why I'm I'm speaking kind of in a circle is because I, I'm, you see something. I'm thinking. I see something. See. I'm thinking out loud, and, yeah. and talking with you about it. So this is, uh, you know, to be sure. If someone says to say, "Well, he's not really teaching that point properly," well, I, no, I'm thinking out loud. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm really not. We're not teaching at all. <laughs> no, we're. This is the whole ethos of this uh, podcast. We're having a conversation, and it's just something that struck me. And as you know, certain things can strike us at certain times in different ways. And they become illuminating. And you say to somebody, oh, did you ever think about that? Yeah, of course I've thought about that. But somehow it hits you Mm -hmm. in a way that that you can't really articulate. Not that you see it better or more, but it's having an impact. And that's something you can't translate, right? You you can say to somebody, yeah, of course, he's he's the Lord of all. Um, Yeah, of course. Uh, of course, he is his majesty, uh, but uh, y- y- d- do you get it? Do you truly 
resonate with that reality. And the more you resonate and comprehend that reality, the the more and more you're you're kind of saying, you know, you're nudging your friend saying, "Did you do you see this? Did you get that?" Yeah, no, that's a good point. It, I wonder if we could flip it over for a second. In other words, we spoke last time about those kings that didn't get on with their spiritual life. Hmm. And so they were stuck. They weren't allowed. Since they made God wait, God right. now makes them wait right. as sort of their punishment uh, before they go up to purgatory. Um, I wonder what it's like to be a king. I mean, we have some saintly examples, right? Louis, Saint, Saint the... Edward, St. Louis. Yeah, and by um, the way, he's one of my grandfathers. He's not your relative. No, he is. Just because it's you do a DNA test and you find out it's that you've got French proven. blood does not it mean that you are related to St. Louis. Proven. Winslow, the Winslow yeah. family. This is why he's now interested in, in royalty, in royalty. everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I do anticipate a certain amount of some. Oh, yeah, we're in an interregnum right now. Though. <laughs> There's no king on the throne. Um, but... What was it, the saints that we do have that were kings? Like, we read the in the breviary. Mm. If you're a priest or a deacon or, or Elizabeth if you're a lay person, you read the breviary, Elizabeth mm-hmm. Hungry. They typically will give us a letter or something that they, write. that they wrote. The most beautiful one, of course, is St. Louis to his son. Right. And, of course, St. Louis's spiritual director and confessor was... St. Thomas Aquinas, of Saint course. Thomas Just Aquinas. getting that in there. That's true. Um, so that means he didn't that do, my he was patron, not very successful at the, at the uh, Crusades. My patron, apparently. well, that's fine. His success is different, but, right? That's he, true. My, but a beautiful letter from one of my grandfathers to his son, another but of my it does mean that my patron was over your patron. Yes. Just saying. Yes, um, well, there, there is that. <laughs> so. But you are definitely, but he's definitely not one of your grandfathers. Well, that's true. Yeah, that's true. But his spiritual father. Yeah. Um. You see in those letters that they realize that they're stewards. You know, like they might have the title king. Right. But kind of like Lord of the Rings, J.R.R. Tolkien, he's got that steward of Gondor. He's not the real king. And you have to you have to give way when the real king shows up. Um, that every one of us on whatever level that we have any authority is a steward. And the reason I say flip it over, don't you think that the reason that we sort of want to be able to have the noble king and we want to use terms like Lord and majesty and everything else is because we realize that I, I don't, I don't want to rule everything. Hmm. I'm not capable of ruling everything. Matter of fact, I find that to be terribly burdensome, but to know that you had someone up there that you could actually serve it. I think it's hitting upon something in our nature that the very way in which we've been made to just do that. We've been made to serve the highest king with the knowledge that the king if we serve him well, is the one who then girds himself and has a sit at table, mm-hmm. you know, and serves us. But I don't want the responsibility of running everyone else's life. You might think I do. Oh, because you do. <laughs> <laughs> at least around here you do. Which well, is that's why, my job here. Which is why I only visit. <laughs> but, you know, so you know how people are, they feel honored when they can say, oh, you know, this famous person is my friend yeah. or this, just like I said, you know, I'm really, these, these, these kings were, yeah, exactly. Where my grandfather. There's a certain sense of being honored by it. Mind you guys, just, you should know that in his office where he tries to run everyone else's life um, in the diocese, <laughs> um, he has a massive picture he had paid of Van Gogh, right? It's El Greco, El Greco, El Greco of St. Louis. It's a devotional. To tell everyone basically that this is my grandfather. It's, he's holding a scepter. Just so you know. And, he's, and with his son next to him. It's a devotional. Thank you very much. And that son is your father probably. They're all my grandfathers. <laughs> so yes, uh, it's a devotional. My father was very pleased uh, to, to That you that got the family him. tree in there. Yes, he's very proud of that. I don't know who grafted that onto there. but He's very proud of that. My mother will be the first to point out the fact that uh, it's by no merit of his that he has a saint in the family. <laughs> but all right, Sanctity so, does not get passed down the bloodline. No, it does not. It does not. So, okay, so we're honored. Like when we know famous people, and we, we say, well, you know, so-and-so is connected to so-and-so. We do this always in the fabric of society and, and in our social lives. And we have just an intuitive sense that we, the, the, the glory of that person is going to flow onto us. But when it comes to... Uh, God and approaching him and his majesty. What is so attractive is to recognize that the place that he's afforded us 
is to be a noble in his court. Yes, yes. And that is an elevation from what we intuitively sense is our natural state. Mm-hmm. And so there's something about that, co- that, that, that implication of royalty and the nobility that is bestowed upon yes. us that we react to and respond to and are drawn toward in part because we're recognizing that on a natural level, it's not ours, mm. but it is a gift to us. And to be able to claim, I am part of this noble yes. royal court. Yes. And we've got to reclaim that. I mean, liturgically, we've tried to reclaim it, right? We certainly have in this diocese in mm-hmm. many ways to try to make sure that what we're doing with the king liturgically has that sense of nobility um, because we're ushered into those things. And if you think about the words that we now use sort of post-Vatican II relative to the faith, we often talk about them as the, those who, who enjoy enjoy the royal priesthood. Right. We don't say the um, indentured servant priesthood. Um, right, right. <laughs> that's us. <laughs> it's a nobility, right. Well, that's it, exactly. That is us. That's true. No, it's true. You, you know, and I want to say, too, um, that that tendency or that natural attraction toward that sense of nobility in a human sovereignty or a mm. human monarchy um, is fraught with problems. You know, it makes no sense that, you know, the royal family of England or the royal family of this country, or for that matter, the royal family of these these Asian empires, you know, throughout the ages, that they are somehow more dignified than any other person, or that they um, earned or merited anything. Uh, they're just born. Yeah, they might not have merited, but they were supposed to keep the the Ariste, right? I mean, they were supposed to translate the excellence. They were of and, but, and, and 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 to be able to embody that because we all do need. To but look so up to often someone. they didn't. Sure, no, you know no they did the precise opposite. I mean, they did really the opposite. I mean, if you look at the if you look at their lives, I mean, on display. I mean, this is the problem. Oftentimes. And this is the tension, right? They would, be, you know, people who would be born into a royal family would complain they're not free to be who they want to be. And at the same time, but how all these they'd be showered with all these trappings and influence and so on and so forth. But at the same time, the people demanded something from them. Yeah. And they wanted to see, as you say, the the excellence. Or even and just they, they wanted to see a show of power or a show of good right. governance or whatever. Benevolence. I mean, it's true. We it, but we cannot live without it. Right. It's 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 woven into us. But the right end is the sovereignty of God. Yeah. And uh, you know, that is the right end. But without God, look how violent and hideous it looks. Yeah. In human history. In human history. Uh, because it turns into, you know, um, either uh, very egocentric, um, condescending type well, of an atheistic monarchy. state is, is ultimately a, a self deification state. Yeah, I mean, it, it looks the same way, and it's it just in different shapes and, and contours. people are just completely disposable. Yeah, but it, but I, I I just want to make sure it's clear out there that I'm not saying that I I'm not making any claim on. Um, you know, the, the goodness of, of royal families. Oh, I'm all about monarchies. I'm totally into monarchies. Well, I, well that's why you're going to um, surrender yourself to my my to royal rule. lineage. <laughs> through the Plantagenet. My noble line. liege. Yes. No, it's true. I mean, at the end of the day, does anything inspire? And it, again, because it doesn't become incarnate, because we haven't experienced it, doesn't mean it's not real. Because it's pointing, it's like a fairy tale. Mm-hmm. It's pointing at something that is real which is the heavenly court. But separated from that reality, yeah. it can rot. So why do you love Cinderella? Like, why do you love, why do, why do the stories about, about um, paupers being raised up to princesses and proper kings and heavily, uh, living ever, ha- happily ever after? And why does Disney um, take the Noschwanstein and place it in the middle of, mm-hmm. of Florida and, or California or wherever and say, wow, isn't this, doesn't this draw people? It does. Even if Ludwig, who built Neuschwanstein, was a complete, <laughs> I think it was a rather big, crazy man. But nevertheless, it, you looked up to the castle. Like you looked up to these things and said, I want to be part of something because you're made to be, as you said, um, part of the noble court. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, I mean, that's really, I think, the right exercise is to say, okay, when I, you know, I look at uh, royalty um, and sovereignty, and say everything that 
is extraordinary about that. Take it and apply it to God. And then recognize that you've been invited to be a part of his noble court. Yes. I mean, and that's, ex- and, and that's the thing that when we talk about looking at the dignity of other people, you know, regardless of their state in life, and this is kind of where you rail against the whole notion of people, some people being better than other people, right? Like nob- nobility being better than serfs, you know, that kind of thinking. We would say, no, that's an absurdity. Yeah, it's not mer- because it's gonna, it's, it has to be merit based. Right. But, and in this case, we're talking about the level of dignity imparted by God. Yeah. All of you are called to be nobles in that royal court. Right, right, and right, your right. rank among them is going to be much, it's going to be discerned to a far greater degree regarding your general, your goodness and your response to grace than anything to do with the state into which you've been born in this world or in yeah. this life or in this society. But, you know, when you approach people and have conversations with people, I think it would be interesting as a as an exercise as a Christian just to to say, all right, this is an acre of God's sovereign kingdom. And this is the noble entrusted with that land. Mm. Who are you? Who are you? And every person then becomes, you know, cloaked in that majesty. And how do you how do you treat the people that you quote unquote subjects, but the ones you ultimately serve, right? Mm-hmm. Um I I think it's it's interesting that that because this is in the human heart and because we gravitate toward it in fairy tales and everything else and and you you can't really eradicate it. it it's that which creates a sort of the romance of 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 who you actually were made to be mm-hmm. the Cinderella story i mean um and at the same time instead of eradicating as we tend to do now um the authorities the the the, the pageantry the the royalty whatever else Instead of just like getting rid of them, which is what we do now, um, holding them to what they're supposed to be mm-hmm. um, and demanding it in some mm-hmm. ways of them, which also means a kind of pietas that I I recognize that as a Catholic, this probably, probably was one of the great things about having a Catholic nation in some ways is that as a Catholic, I will I will give you the deference that you do, you are due as the ruler of this of this land, knowing that you're a steward under God, but we're both going to kneel down at the same altar rail. To the King of Kings, right? I mean, what a leveling playing field that was. Bradsinger you talked about this as the level of playing field being the confessional line. Yeah, yeah. You know that you would have the the movers and shakers of a town. Yeah, with the with the least influential standing in the same line. Yeah. And so, in other words, to I guess you could say that the, the same line as Augustine, you could say as a king, like with you, Saint Augustine says, "I am a sheep, but for you, I am a shepherd." Yeah, and the faithful should make their shepherds whether they be secular or ecclesial, um, they should hold them up in honor. But that honor means be what you're made to be right now. Like this is the role you've been given and do it with the kind of ability. I'll do my role right now because I might be in your place someday. (laughs) I might be the one who's the shepherd. Mm -hmm. Um, But wherever I am right now, to be noble in that field. Right, to rise to the occasion and be authentic. Yeah. You know, and and that's the, 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 you know, the, the great reversal there of, or is he mean counterly intuitive, uh, which is the, um, oh, the 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 greatest of all is the servant of all, right? You know, to to ascend is to descend, yep. And it's it's that paradox uh, where that that nobility is found ultimately in a nobility of love, and. Uh, in any event, uh, without sure, without going too far, because I know we're kind of running to, to the end of things, and it's not uh, the right moment to start swirling around another topic. We'll do that next time. Yes, we should talk about love. But we should. I am the doctor of love, right? Oh, th- that's true. That's what they always make fun of me as. as My doctor your doctor Thomas is Thomas Understanding of Divine Charity. Yes, because those who study... Uh, don't even finish that sentence. <laughs> so, before we go... Can't. <laughs> some of you are going to go out and get trees. Yes. I have... Two things I have to say. What do you mean going to get a... Some of us have already gotten Some a tree. Some have already gotten trees. Please, for the love of God, mm-hmm. let it be real. <laughs> right? And number two, no uh, bluish kind of garish white lights. Oh, those they are They have horrible. to be soft. 
Yeah. They have to be flame-like, right? They have to be... Incandescent. In, I mean, ex- absolutely. You have to look... The LEDs have not arrived. Rare, They're getting closer. Rare is the LED that has that warm... Those kind of lumens. ...flame-like color. If you want to create the atmosphere, oh. it's got to imitate fire. Don't set your tree on fire, but you no. got you to yeah. imitate it. Uh, I, that's I'm, all I'm saying before we go. I'm in agreement. Oh, that's, that's a really good one. Uh, for me, it's also about scent. Mm. You know, I love the pine no, set. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's my pine cones as you came in. The pine cones, <laughs> the candle. I'm all, I'm all the, the diffuser I'm happy with too. This, you know, this yeah, yeah. modern fangled thing where you're diffusing. Basically, it's a humidifier with oil in it. Oil in it, right? So give me some pine oil on that thing. And it just smells so beautiful and lovely. It's Do you really remember, you remember once, uh, we'll end here, but once we were in a, living in a rectory together at St. Thomas, as many of you know, and... We had a tree that was so old and dead, but we refused to take it down. It was almost March. And so, so we just loved the Christmas tree. So, so it was we went out light bought, in the morning. We went out and bought pine spray. It kept spraying it the tree. <laughs> so it, it smelled. It smelled. <laughs> you know, we, and it turned, there were no needles left on it. Oh, gosh. I mean, it would, you, you run, brush against it and a thousand <laughs> needles would fall. The poor, oh, the poor woman who came in to clean. We, uh, we, we almost got it to Easter. We did. I yeah. Mean, I think if we put a, a any anything any flame close in 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 seconds in seconds it yeah. would go up gone yeah Absolutely I mean gone. you've seen that here with a fire pit you know, oh it's great these we, things go up like that yeah, we have this, all those trees and those high high tall trees and they go up in a second we still wonder there were more house burnings with with Christmas trees yeah, that's true now don't don't be discouraging people from a real tree though no not because the the modern lighting is so safe yeah. but remember as a kid you touch a bulb and you burn yourself it's true. <laughs> I mean, how many cats, you know, uh, have burnt hoofs because they touched it or they, you know, remember the cats? They would, they would go at it and they get burnt. But two as a kid, I would touch them. I know. I remember the, the bubble one. Fang- remember the bubble one? The bubble what? The, 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 the liquid inside would bubble up. Oh, and the, yeah. And the, and they're the, selling those again. Are they really? Saw them in the store. They're probably retro now. Yeah, they're retro. Yeah. No, those are kind of fun. As a, as a kid, we had tinsel. Did you do tinsel? It's so stupid. Tinsel. Tinsel. I mean, it was so much fun, though. I, I hated it. The cat would eat the tinsel and then recycle it. Yeah, well. I mean, that's, that was another issue. <laughs> With these noble thoughts. Yes, yes. We'll let yes. you all go. Yes, we'll let Have you go. Have a great week. God all right, you. sounds good. Makes me wanna scream From the rooftop to the screen Thanks for listening to this episode of From the Rooftop. For updates about new episodes, special guests, and exclusive deals for From the Rooftop listeners, sign up at rooftoppodcast.com. And remember, for more great ways to deepen your faith, check out all the spiritual resources available at tanbooks.com. And we'll see you again next time. From the Rooftop. From the Rooftop.